This is Mike Grell, and you're listening to Warlord Worlds. Welcome back, and thank you for listening to Warlord Worlds, a fan podcast devoted to the comic creations of writer and artist Mike Grell, including The Warlord, John Sable, and Green Arrow. I'm Ruth. And I'm Darren, and this is a fan podcast. We're not affiliated with Mike Grell, and the opinions expressed are just ours. We do this podcast simply because we enjoy reading and talking about the comics of Mike Grell. The number of issues covered in each episode varies based on story arcs. Today we're talking about The Warlord, numbers 44 through 46, Green Arrow, number 39 and 40, and John Sable Freelance, number 33, which is a very special issue of that series. If you enjoy the podcast, please check out MikeGrell.com. That's his official site where you'll find all of the latest news. Mike is back out on the road doing a few conventions, and his website is the perfect place to keep up with his schedule. We were very lucky to see Mike at GalaxyCon here in Raleigh, and we had a wonderful time visiting with him as well as Jeff Messer and Donald Troll during the weekend. It was our first convention in nearly two years, and it was fantastic to get to see Mike Grell. If you're able to see Mike at a convention, pre-orders for convention sketches may be placed through Scott Cress at CatskillComics.com. And if you can't make it to a convention but would like to get an original drawing, then Scott Cress can help you with that as well. Just make your request at CatskillComics.com. Scott is a terrific gentleman, and we've truly enjoyed getting to know him over the years. In addition to Mike, Scott handles commission requests for several other comic professionals, including Ramona Fraden, Bob Hall, Ron Friends, Ron Wagner, and many, many more. Other great places to keep up with the latest news about Mike Grell's projects are at the official Masterstroke Studios Mike Grell Universe page on Facebook and on Twitter at Grell Official. And of course, the Mike Grell page on Facebook is a wonderful way to stay current on Mike's projects. Longtime fans Gus Sabalios and Jeff Messer do a great job with that site. We enjoy giving shout outs to our friends and sharing listener feedback, so please feel free to write us anytime and join in on the conversations. We'd love to hear your thoughts about any of Mike Grell's titles. I'm always interested in hearing what others think of Mike Grell's stories and art, and it's great to hear how people first discovered his art. We'll provide our email address and other ways to reach us at the end of the episode. Warlord Worlds is part of the Rad Adventures Podcast Network. If you enjoy the show, please consider checking out our other podcasts that are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Xenozoic Xenophiles covers the post-apocalyptic adventure series Xenozoic Tales, featuring Cadillacs and Dinosaurs by writer and artist Mark Schultz. And Trekker Talk is devoted to the adventures of 23rd century bounty hunter Mercy St. Clair from the pages of the sci-fi comic Trekker by writer and artist Ron Randall. Mike Grell, Mark Schultz, and Ron Randall are our favorite comic creators. Their stories are always filled with adventure and interesting characters, and their art is excellent. We hope you'll try out our other shows, and we'll be sure to include links to those podcasts in our show notes. But now it's time to talk about some great Mike Grell comics, right after this promo for another podcast you might enjoy. When you think of podcasts about religion, you probably think of this. But at least one religion podcast sounds more like this. I kick ass for the Lord. Darkness to Light is a relatively geeky production in which Alan and Emily discuss topics of faith, religion, and spirituality. But we do so through the lens of pop culture, like movies, TV, and comic books, because we're nerds. Our primary focus will be on Christianity, because that's what we know best. But all religious content is on the table. Well, think about it, Scully, from vampirism to Catholicism. This is an occasional cast, to be recorded and released as the mood strikes, with topics ranging from in-depth reviews to personal rants about some small aspect of theology or church history, because we're theological nerds. 
these topics interest you, check out dorknesstolight.blogspot.com for our more regular content. Or dorknesstolight.tumblr.com for our more irregular content. Memes and puns, mostly. My bad. Dorkness to Light. Often irreverent, rarely sacrilegious. The Warlord, number 44, April 1981. The Gamble. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Inks, Vince Coletta. Colors, Adrian Roy. Letters, Ben Oda. Editor, Jack C. Harris. Our story opens with Jennifer Morgan waking on a beach after being washed ashore following the sinking of her boat. As she opens her eyes, she sees a strange cloaked figure watching over her. Our story shifts to Travis Morgan and Atune arriving at the city of Bantam, near the half-sunlight, half-shadow Terminator that separates Skataris from the world above. Morgan doesn't want to lose time, but he thinks the detour is worth it because he needs a new sword to replace the powerful hellfire that he threw into the lake to rid himself of its cursed influence. As he goes to search, Atune steps into a local bar where he is lured into a game of chance with Tavalko, even though the barmaid repeatedly warns him he will lose. Tavalko puts a pearl under a shell and begins to shuffle the shells on the table. Later, Morgan returns to find that Atune has gambled away all of their money and their horses. The gambler offers a deal. He will return their horses if they do him a favor. There is a tower within a walled maze near the city. At the top of the tower is a beautiful jewel that he wants. Morgan reluctantly agrees, and the gambler leads them to the gate to the maze. As the pair steps inside the gate, it closes and locks behind them. Tavalko tells them they now have extra motivation because the key to the gate is in the same chamber at the top of the tower along with the jewel. Within the maze, our heroes are frustrated at every step. In addition to the constant twists and turns and dead ends, they must also dodge traps set within the maze, and at one point they are confronted by a pack of rabid wolves. At last, they find the entrance to the tower, which is surrounded by a moat. Inside, they are surprised to find it filled with rows of empty suits of armor, but no guards. However, as they begin to make their way up the winding stairs, the suits of armor come to life and attack them. Grabbing a torch from the wall, Morgan topples the suits of armor down the stairs behind them, but the fire from the torch spreads, and soon the tower is engulfed in flames. The pair run up the stairs and find the chamber with the jewel and the key. But as the flames fill the room, Morgan chooses to only take the key, and the pair leap from the top of the tower and splash into the surrounding moat below. Back at the bar, Tavalko is not pleased, and refuses to return their horses without the jewel. But he offers Morgan one last opportunity, if he can win a game of chance. The shell game begins, when suddenly Morgan's sword slices the gambler's hand from his arm and the pearl drops to the floor, showing that it was never under a shell at all. As he cries in pain, Morgan tells him he got off easy. Outside, the two are joined by Shakira, who has been looking for Morgan and chooses to join them on their quest for Jennifer. As the trio makes one more detour to retrieve ammunition where Morgan buried it near his crashed plane, we see Shakira enter one of the ancient facilities filled with lost technology. Gazing at a city on a screen, she cries a single tear. The cover by Mike Grell features a montage of several images of Morgan and Shakira. We see Morgan with a gun in one image and a sword in another image, and we see Shakira in both her human form and cat form. The double-page title page shows a city bathed in golden light and shadows, and we can see the maze and the tower in the distance just beyond the city. The image of Morgan punching a tune on page 6 for losing their money and horses is terrific. It's very three-dimensional, and it looks like he's going to fly off the page. I like the different perspectives that Mike Grell uses within the maze to show the danger and the difficulties they face. And I love seeing Shakira waiting for them outside, which just shows she's always around and always aware of what's going on. The first page and the last page are full of intrigue. I really want to know what's ahead for Jennifer, who we see awaken on the first page, and I'm very intrigued to see why Shakira is shedding a tear on that last page. This series always makes you want to read the next issue as soon as possible. The Warlord number 45, May 1981, Nightmare in Vista Vision. 
Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Colors, Adrian Roy. Inks, Bob Smith. Letters, Ben Oda. Editor, Ross Andrew. Our story opens with Jennifer Morgan still on the beach where she washed ashore. She has tried to talk to the strange man who rescued her, who is wearing a cloak and hood and is cradling a small box, but he never speaks. She backs away in fear when he suddenly draws his sword, but then she sees him strike and kill a saber-toothed tiger that leaps from the jungle. The man begins to panic and looks frantically for the small box that he dropped when he pulled out his sword. As he recovers it, he quietly speaks to the box, saying, Forgive me, master. And he continues, saying, I heard her speak the name of your mortal enemy, Travis Morgan. Our story shifts to Travis Morgan, Shakira, and Atun, arriving at the village of the tree-dwelling dwarves, where Morgan knows he left an earlier sword in their protection. They are pleased to see him, but while he and the village leader are retrieving his sword, a giant cyclops attacks the village. Morgan rushes above ground with his newly retrieved sword to attack the intruder, but the giant cyclops easily knocks him to the ground and puts several of the small dwarves into a large sack and walks out of the village. Morgan learns that the Cyclops has been regularly attacking the village and taking hostages, and he, Atun, and Shakira race to save the kidnapped villagers. Tracking the Cyclops through the jungle, they come across a giant tree trunk over a chasm that the Cyclops has crossed. Morgan quickly comes up with a plan, and Atun stays behind to ready a trap while Morgan and Shakira cross the tree trunk and continue searching the jungle on the other side. They find the Cyclops has joined two others in a secluded cave, and they appear to be preparing to cook the villagers they took hostage. (coughs) Seeing the villagers locked in a cage suspended from a tree, Shakira transforms into her cat form and climbs the tree and leaps onto the cage. There, she transforms back into her human form and releases the villagers from the cage. When the three Cyclops see their dinner escaping, they rush to the cage but Morgan is waiting and swings across their path, knocking one of them to the ground, where Morgan takes the opportunity to kill it quickly before it can recover. Meanwhile, Shakira has raced ahead with the villagers, and they have crossed the giant tree trunk spanning the chasm. Morgan begins to cross the log with the two remaining Cyclops in pursuit, but then Atun cuts the roots holding the log in place just as Morgan leaps safely to the ground. The log falls into the chasm, taking one of the remaining Cyclops with it. However, the last Cyclops manages to grab onto a ledge. Morgan, Shakira, Atun, and the villagers push a large rock from the ledge which tumbles down onto the Cyclops, dislodging its hold and sending it falling into the chasm. This action-packed story begins with a terrific cover by Mike Grell of Morgan riding a black stallion and holding his sword. There's also a dinosaur in the background that isn't in the issue, but we'll say more about that later. The story gets off to an exciting start as we join Jennifer back at the beach. The double-page title page of the saber-toothed tiger attacking is stunning, and the sequence with the man speaking softly into the small box is intriguing. It's fun to see Morgan revisit the tree-dwelling dwarves to retrieve a sword, and I like the perspectives Mike Grell uses on page 6 when Morgan is getting the sword. There are a couple of excellent panels on that page. The fun quickly fades, however, when the Cyclops attacks, but the pages that follow are action-packed. The perspective Mike Grell uses on page 9 really shows how large the tree trunk over the chasm is, and I really like the sequence of Shakira transforming into a cat to climb the tree and rescue the kidnapped villagers on pages 11 and 12. There's also a great image at the top of page 15, with Shakira and one of the villagers in the foreground as we see Morgan running in the background while being chased by the two remaining Cyclops. Another neat thing about this issue is that it is written with stage directions, the way a movie screenplay would be written. That fits perfectly with the title, which references Fist Division, which is an homage to the many films of the legendary Ray Harryhausen, as is The Battle with the Cyclops. It's another fun issue with the promise of more action to come. The Warlord, number 46, June 1981. X Be My Destiny. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Inks, Romeo Tongal. Colors, Adrian Roy. Letters, Ben Oda. Editor, Ross Andrew. Our story starts with Morgan, Atune, and Shakira discovering the wreckage of Jennifer's ship on a secluded beach. They decide to split up to continue the search, with Atune heading south along the coast, while Morgan heads north toward the Land of Shadow. Shakira joins Morgan and rides on his shoulder in her cat form. (laughs) 
During their ride, a large dinosaur rushes from the forest toward Morgan. Morgan steadies his aim and fires his gun, hitting the charging dinosaur in the head, killing it instantly. However, as the dinosaur falls, its momentum carries it forward, crashing into Morgan's horse and sending Helm and Shakira hurtling to the ground. Morgan slowly wakes and sees the image of a beautiful woman standing above him, but then he realizes it is Azrael, the angel of death, and he assumes she has come to take his soul to the afterlife. However, she tells him she is pleased with the roar of his pistol and the shriek of his slashing blade. She is not there to take him. She is there to take another. He frantically turns to see the lifeless body of Shakira in her cat form, just as her human soul rises to take the hand of Azrael. Morgan screams no and grabs his sword and follows the figure through the forest and sees them enter the gates of hell with the phrase, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Morgan throws open the gates and strides inside. As he walks forward, he sees the figures of those he has killed calling out to him, including Stryker, Shabal, Chakal, and others. Morgan then jumps from the path into a ring of flames where he sees a giant figure of Azrael. He lands upon the palm of her hand and declares he has come for Shakira. Azrael looks at him and says, Why do you persist in opposing someone who you have served so well? She is disappointed but offers him a deal. In exchange for ten years of his life, she will return Shakira. To seal the deal, she stretches out her hand, and an X representing the number ten appears on his chest like a brand. Morgan grabs the lifeless body of Shakira and races back up the path and through the closing gates. As the doors close, he passes out. Shakira shakes him until he wakes, and he looks around and sees the carcass of the giant dinosaur he shot. There are no memories of the events with Azrael. He and Shakira simply believe they are waking following the encounter with the giant lizard. However, Shakira then notices several new scars on Morgan's chest, and he looks down to see the scars form an X. The cover to this issue makes us think that the covers to issues 45 and 46 were accidentally exchanged when published. The cover to this issue 46 features Morgan battling two giant cyclops on a tree trunk over a chasm which was a key sequence in the previous issue, 45. Meanwhile, the cover to issue 45 has Morgan on his horse with a dinosaur in the background. The titles on the covers are correct, with issue 45 having the title Nightmare and issue 46 having the title X Be My Destiny. But I'm quite certain that Mike Grell intended the cover images to be on the opposite issues when published, since the covers obviously go with those stories. The issue itself is excellent. We get a page one reminder of the current story arc, immediately followed by an exciting sequence with a giant lizard. The character of Azrael is mysterious, and her dialogue is interesting, and she obviously appreciates all of the souls that Morgan has given her. It's neat to see some characters from the past reappear in the issue, and Morgan is in true form as he rushes straight into danger with no thought for himself, as he is ready and willing to sacrifice everything to save Shakira. I also like that neither Morgan nor Shakira remember the events when they wake at the end of the issue, you can almost imagine it was all a dream, until you see the fresh scars that clearly make the letter X on his chest. Some of my favorite art in the issue includes the double-page title page, when Morgan on his horse rounds a corner coming face-to-face -face with the giant lizard. The askew angle of the image when Azrael first appears is excellent, because it creates a feeling of being off-balance, which fits the story well. I really love the image of Morgan throwing open the gates. The use of perspective and shadow is excellent and makes the gates look large and imposing. I also love the splash page, when Morgan leaps into the ring of flames, and it looks like he is swinging on a lock of Azrael's hair. And that's followed by a terrific image of Morgan standing on Azrael's hand. It's a very symbolic image that she has him in the palm of her hand. It's a terrific issue, and leaves you wanting to know what comes next. Between the Golden Age of Atlantis and the rise of recorded history, there were ages undreamed of. Hither came heroes and villains possessing swords and magic, whose deeds became tales and legends. I have come to relate these sagas. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Days of High Adventure, a new podcast discussing a variety of comics that fall into the fantasy or sword and sorcery genre. Available on most podcast services and Anchor FM.
Green Arrow number 39, October 1990. Sunday on the Tarmac with George. Written by Mike Grell. Art by Dennis Cowan and Shay Anton Pensa. Letters, Albert de Guzman. Colors, Julia Lackament. Associate Editor, Katie Main. Editor, Mike Gold. Our story picks up following the events of the previous story arc in which Oliver was accused of treason. He managed to get a recording of the members of the CIA and DEA who were the real culprits, and that has led to a surprising invitation. We see Oliver arrive at an airport. His head is still shaved from his attempts to conceal his identity in the previous story. On the tarmac, he is surrounded by armed Secret Service personnel and searched before being taken aboard Air Force One, where he meets the President. However, the conversation that follows is anything but cordial. While the President acknowledges the involvement of members of the CIA and DEA and disagrees with their methods, he still feels the importance of the Panama Canal, both economically and strategically, justifies their intentions, if not their methods. It's a win in the President's opinion, because in the end, no one really got hurt. This infuriates Oliver, who points out he was framed for treason, hunted like an animal, targeted for assassination, and that his name and face have been spread around the world as a traitor. As he leaves Air Force One, the President tells his press secretary to release their prepared statement, and before Oliver gets home, the story, now told from the point of view of the government, has spread through the media. And while the stories say that Oliver has been cleared of all charges, that part of the press release is little more than a footnote and gets little attention in the news coverage. Back at Sherwood Florist, Oliver and Dinah have a tense conversation, and she correctly guesses that he is leaving. He isn't sure where he's going, but he knows he needs to get away for a while. Before he leaves, Marion, who helped him when he was on the run, arrives in the hopes of getting the job that Oliver promised her. The timing seems fortuitous, because she can be there to help Dinah with the shop while he is away. Our story ends with Oliver hitchhiking in the rain through the northwestern mountains. The cover features a somber sepia-toned image of Green Arrow holding an American flag with the slogan, Expatriate. The look on Oliver's face clearly illustrates the sadness he feels at being betrayed by his government. This is definitely a transition issue. It needs to wrap up the loose ends following the previous four-part story, as well as to set up the story for the series of upcoming issues. The resolution certainly isn't a clear win for Oliver, and that is clearly conveyed to the reader, who feels the same frustrations experienced by our hero. The title of the issue is a play on the musical Sunday in the Park with George, and references George Bush, who was president at the time the issue was published. There is also a line of dialogue in the issue that says, Why is it always someone named Oliver? which is a reference to the events surrounding Oliver North from the time of publication. As for the art, my favorite page comes late in the issue when we see Sherwood Florist at night. The shadows and colors create a nice mood, and the images of Oliver and Dinah inside show the distance and sadness between them. I also really love the final page that shows Oliver hitchhiking. The rain does a great job of conveying the mood as he begins his quest, and the mountains in the background are simply stunning. Green Arrow number 40, December 1990, Spirit Quest. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Letters, Steve Haney. Colors, Julia Laquament. Associate Editor, Katie Main. Editor, Mike Gold. Our story opens with a red-tailed hawk perched on a tree. A rabbit races through the bushes below, and then the hawk swoops from the branches toward its prey. Next, we see Oliver walking along the side of the road. His blonde hair has grown back, and he has his bow and arrows discreetly hidden in a backpack and cylindrical carrying tube. He comes upon a pickup truck on the side of the road with its hood open, and he hears a voice saying, It took you long enough. Oliver turns to see an elderly Native American man sitting in the shade of a tree and Oliver asks how he knew to expect him. The elderly man replies that Oliver shot an arrow at a rabbit, but missed. The rabbit in turn woke a hawk from its nap. The hawk didn't miss its prey, but it did startle a deer which rushed past him, so he knew to expect Oliver to come along eventually. Oliver fixes the pickup truck, and the two ride off together, but after driving for a while, the man stops the truck and says they have to walk from there. Oliver looks ahead at the winding road, but the old man tells him they aren't going that way. 
They're going up a mountain, and he points into the distance. Oliver takes his bow and arrow from their cases and follows the old man into the forest. There they see a cougar in the distance, resting in the shade, and later as they build a fire while making camp, they hear wolves howling in the night. Oliver asks the man's name and what tribe he is from. The man replies that he is called Stalking Wolf, and he has walked this country from north to south and east to west. He is invisible to most, because most people and animals choose to ignore him. After an evening filled with conversation, Oliver comments that the man has asked him thousands of questions, but has never asked his name. As the old man settles in to go to sleep, he replies, that's because he hasn't given him a name yet. As Oliver drifts off to sleep, he begins to dream of wolves and caribou and more. He is a hunter, human one moment and a wolf the next. He wakes the next morning, but the old man is gone. Oliver begins to track the old man through the forest and eventually starts to realize the animals around him, like the caribou and wolves, are ignoring him as if he is invisible. He stops for the night and builds a fire, and as he sleeps, he sees the old man in his dreams. Stalking Wolf tells him, You have done well, my son, and he raises a spear and tells Oliver that he must now go on his own way alone. When Oliver wakes the next morning, he sees the spear from his dream in the ground near him. A necklace is tied to the spear, and on the necklace is a green arrow. He has been reminded of his name. The cover features a beautiful painting of Stalking Wolf in full traditional headdress. It's a stunning image. And oh my goodness, this issue is filled with so many stunning images. There simply aren't enough words to explain how beautiful this issue is. For this special 40th issue, we are treated to Mike Grell's art throughout the book, and it's glorious. We've commented before about how well Mike draws animals, and this issue is filled with amazing examples, including a red-tailed hawk, wolves, caribou, a bear, and a cougar. All are simply gorgeous. And the landscapes are magical. Forests, mountains, waterfalls. Mike really captures the beauty of nature. The story is just as wonderful as the art. The character of Stalking Wolf is compelling from the first panel as he becomes Oliver's spirit guide. Their conversations are thought-provoking, and I love the way that dream sequences use verses from traditional Navajo chants and poems. One of my favorite parts of the issue is when Stalking Wolf tells Oliver he hasn't asked his name, because he hasn't given him a name yet. Then we get the terrific payoff at the end of the story, when the necklace is left for him, with a green arrow to remind Oliver of who he is. We usually go through and pick out a few favorite pages and panels from these issues, but honestly, this issue could be open to any page, and a Mike Grell fan would be stunned by the beautiful art. But we'll name a few examples of the best of the best, because there is nothing but the best in these pages. The double-page title page features a close-up of the red-tailed hawk, with small images of Oliver walking along the bottom of the image. The image of the cougar lounging and watching Oliver and Stalking Wolf pass is beautiful, and the image of Oliver and Stalking Wolf by the fire with a wolf howling in the distance sets a perfect mood. My favorite page is definitely during Oliver's dream sequence when he sees himself as a wolf hunting caribou through a snow-covered forest. So while those might be my favorites, I still have to say that every page in this issue is a treasure, and the story works so well with the art, and together they make this a truly special issue indeed. It's really fabulous. Monthly, monthly, monthly! It's Action Film Face-Off! Hello, I'm Jason the Weasel Skull Albrick, and I'd like to tell you about a podcast I do with my brother, Jared Albrick, the yard sale artist. Action Film Face-Off! Yes, thank you, Jared. Action Film Face-Off is a podcast where my brother and I, who are both military combat vets... Jason was a Navy SEAL! Jason was not a Navy SEAL. Jason was a military intelligence wing. But anyway, in each episode of Action Film Face-Off, we select two different action films. Some of them have Chuck Norris. Technically speaking, none of them have had Chuck Norris yet. But it could happen, because we use a randomizer set between 1970 and modern day to select our two films. So you'll always get two films, each from a different year. Our randomizer has spikes on it! 
we use a Google random number generator, so it does not have spikes on it. And we put the films into our video dome arena. It also has spikes. It does not have spikes. <laughs> but we discuss the films and score them through six different rounds of criteria. I score Bond films very high. Okay, that's true. But anyway, by the end of the episode, we crown one of the action films the champion of action film face-off. Next episode, Jason fights a bear. <laughs> Jason is not fighting a bear, but please give our show a listen. We're part of the Longbox Crusade Network of Shows. Pat Samson killed a man with a sword once. Ah! I can neither confirm nor deny that statement, but you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and most podcatchers under Longbox Crusade, or you can subscribe to just our show by searching for Action Film Face Off. Come see the blood fly! And that's Action Film Face Off. We do, indeed, invite you to come and see The Blood Fly. I just said that. John Sable Freelance, number 33, February 1986. Written and illustrated by Mike Grell. Letters, Ken Brusnak. Colors, Janice Cohen. Editor, Mike Gold. John Sable arrives by plane in Los Angeles, disguised as children's book writer B.B. Flem. Joining him are his editor, Eden Kendall, and his illustrator, Mike Blackman. They are there to meet with Sushio Aragones, who is doing the storyboard illustrations for an animated TV special based on the leprechauns from B.B. Flem's books. While riding in the car, John warns them that cartoonists are usually short and dumpy with poor social skills, so they should be prepared. However, as the door opens at his home, Eden and Mike are swept off their feet by the tall, handsome, suave, and sophisticated Sushio Aragonis, while John, in his B.B. Flem disguise, feels a bit foolish and maybe a little inadequate. As the group begins to review the storyboard illustrations, our issue transitions, and we see a set of new credits as the story begins to unfold. Cave of the half Bites. Animation by Sergio Aragonis. Voice characterization, a.k.a. letters, by Stan Sakai. Screenplay by Lee Dozel, from a story by B.B. Flem. Cell painting, a.k.a. colors, by Janice Cohen. Film editing by Mike Gold. Produced and directed by Mike Grell. Our story opens in Dublin, at the height of the potato famine. We see St. James Gate, where Guinness L is brewed, and across King's Bridge in Phoenix, We see a small door where the wee folk make their own brew, and Guinness, by comparison, is but diluted dew. But potatoes are needed for their drink, and potatoes are in short supply. Just then, the small door opens, and three wee men are tossed out into the darkness. We hear the council leader tell Grog O'Leary, Dusty Cruster, and Dooley that they are the most disagreeable leprechauns and the community is tired of their bickering and putting them in danger by being captured by humans, which they call stompers. With the potato famine, our trio knows they will not be welcomed with any other leprechauns due to the scarcity of food, so they decide their only option is to set sail to America, and they stow away on a ship leaving the next morning. Aboard the ship, they meet a far darig, which is a wizard or shaman, known for always wearing a red coat. They are also known for liking their solitude and for contributing to nightmares. Knowing it's best to avoid the far darig, each of our trio uses their leprechaun powers to transform into an albatross, knowing that sailors see them as good luck. The trio perch atop the rigging, bringing the crew delighted smiles as the ship makes its way across the Atlantic to New York. There, the trio find a green and lush land where things grow easily on the mostly empty island of Manhattan, and they begin to set up a new underground colony. The far Darig decides to join them, though he mostly locks himself away in his own underground area. However, over time, humans begin to move onto the island as well, and our trio of leprechauns know they must take action. Thankfully, potatoes grow easily, and they have plenty to make their strong ale. They spike the drinks of the city father and lead architect, who suddenly decide they must create a central park on the island that will be free of development. From that day forward, the city grows up around the park, but within the park, the leprechauns are safe in their beautiful green land. Over time, other wee folk began to join them from different communities from around the world as they arrive and settle in New York. 
As B.B. Flem turns the final page of the story, we see delighted smiles from him and Mike. However, both realize that Eden and Sushio are missing. They then hear laughing coming from the hot tub and know it's time for them to discreetly leave. This is a very different and very fun issue of John Sable, and we remember it fondly from reading it back when it was first released. We were already fans of Sergio Aragonés from his series Grew the Wanderer, and here he is being represented by the character Sushio Aragonés. There was already a connection with Mike Grell very early on, as the second and third appearances of Gru were actually in backup stories in Mike's Star Slayer comic series. We're also fans of Stan Sakai from his Usagi Ujimbo series, so rereading this issue was very special indeed. Everything gets off to a great start with a fun cover by both Mike Grill and Sergio Aragonis. We see Mike's illustration of John Sable sitting at his desk dutifully writing late at night, with a note from Eden Kendall telling him he has a deadline the next morning. In the foreground are a group of leprechauns drawn by Sergio Aragonis, sneaking off with many of John's belongings, including a wallet full of cash, his pistol, and a bottle of Bailey's Irish cream. It's a fun cover, and wonderful to see the two different art styles in a single illustration. The story inside is great fun, with Mike Grell illustrating the bookends of John, Eden, and Mike arriving in Los Angeles to review the storyboards, while Sergio Aragonis illustrates the main part of the issue through the storyboards from the animated TV special. We love the credits for this part of the issue. Such a fun idea to do them as if they're credits for the TV special. The issue is filled with great art from both creators. We love the expressions on everyone's faces when they first see Sushio Aragonis. Mike Blackman is leaning in to get a better look, and Eden Kendall looks like she's going to pass out from his good looks. Meanwhile, John, a.k.a. B.B. Flynn, just looks on in disappointed surprise. Anyone who's a fan of Sergio Aragonis' art knows what they're going to get from his part of the issue, which is playful caricatures with lots of visual gags. It's really impossible to adequately convey how much fun the story is because the art is just too important. Let's just say, if you haven't read this issue before, do yourself a favor and pick it up when you can. You won't be disappointed. Next up is listener feedback, when we share emails and other messages we've received since last time. We appreciate every comment and want to sincerely thank everyone who wrote in or got in touch through social media. Sean Ross let us know that he loved our coverage of the Mike Grell story and the Green Arrow Super Spectacular, celebrating the 80th anniversary of Green Arrow. Thank you very much, Sean. Professor Allen wrote to let us know he thought our last episode was excellent. That means a lot to us, Professor. Alan Wright shared his thoughts, saying the Green Arrow Spectacular is a great collection, and Alan also commented about the fitting tribute from Larry O'Neill for his father, Denny O'Neill. John Baker shared his excitement with us about our last episode as well. John has been a constant supporter of all of our podcasts and a good friend. Thank you, John. Bill Lynn wrote, Thanks for a great listen as always. Loved the long, long long-awaited return of Mike to the pages of Green Arrow. And the Bolivia quote had me re-watching Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid yet again. Love how Mike has always referenced other works in his own, from Don Quixote to The Tracker. Over the years, he's had me hunting down plenty of authors, books, and films I wouldn't have come across otherwise. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts, Bill. It's terrific that you've tracked down other works Mike's mentioned over the years. And I think it's great that you were inspired to rewatch Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid yet again. We agree that it's a wonderful film. Ralph Grosser wrote to say, Mike has inspired me to take up shooting American longbows. I'm also now a Howard Hill fan. Well, that's exciting to hear, Ralph, and I imagine it's a really fun hobby. And thanks to a gift from our friend Keith G. Baker, we read the biography of Howard Hill and really appreciated learning more about his life, talents, and skill. We were fortunate to see our friend comic artist Thomas Zoller at a recent convention. We had a great conversation about the warlord with him and were delighted to pick up a beautiful sketch he did of Travis Morgan and Tara. For those who aren't familiar with Tom's work, he attended the Kubert School and has written and drawn a variety of comics for several publishers, and he also writes and draws several of his own creator-owned titles as well. I love Tom's art style, and he is a great storyteller. I recently enjoyed reading his book, Time and Vine, which involves time travel based at a winery, and my favorite of all of his creations is Love and Capes. That series combines heroes, humor, and romance. 
If you liked Lois and Clark, I know you'll enjoy this. Next, we want to extend our thanks to everyone who supported us on social media. These are people who promoted our last episode and shared comments. If we miss a name, let us know and we'll include it next time. And please do forgive us if we mispronounce your name. If that happens, let us know and we'll be happy to correct that next time as well. Al Sedano of Resurrections and Adam Warlock and Thanos podcast. Alan Wright from BoldOutlaw.com. Austin Appleby. Bill Lynn. Brian Mulvey. Chris at BTOM Bat Books from the Professor Frenzy Show. Clinton Robison of Coffee and Comics. Comic Book Chip. Comics in the Golden Age. Creator Talks with Christopher Calloway. Colin Stapleton from the Worst Comics Podcast Ever. David Drake. Derek W.C. of the Fan Holes Podcast and History of Comics on Film. Dewey Castle. Dr. G. Man of Nerdology of the Pulp to Pixels Podcast. Ed and Terry Moore of Till Productions. Jaris Al Pop. Jerry Green of the Professor Frenzy Show. Green Arrow Collection. Greg Engel. Jared Albrecht, the Yard Cell Artist. Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff Messer of the Mike Grell Page and Issues With. Jerry Hyde. John Baker, who does sci-fi TV reviews at 3 If By Space. Keith G. Baker. Kirk Spencer at Big Five Army. Lori Sutton, former DC editor and Dragon Con friend and writer of You Choose Adventure Books. Long Box Crusade podcast with Pat, Jared, Jason, and Delvin. Luke Giaconetti of Earth Destruction Directive and from the Two Two Freaks Network. Lynn Randall, Madness Mox. Awesome actor Mark Ryan, who works on The Pilgrim with Mike Grell. Pat Sampson, a.k.a. Chris Dados. Paul Hicks of Waiting for Doom and the DCOCD podcast and The Gary Show. Professor Allen of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Ralph Grosser. Randy Andrews, the sci-fi guy of Soundtrack Alley. Randy Carter. Robert Myers. Ruth Michaels. Siskoid of Siskoid's Blog of Geekery and First Strike and Lonely Hearts Romance. Stella of Batgirl to Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. Steve Bridge. Podcrasher Tim Price from The Outcasters. Tom Smith of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. Vic Sage of Pop Culture Retrorama. And Warren Montgomery of Will Lil Comics. Before we go, we want to provide our contact information. If you want to contact us directly or have something you would like to have read on the show, please send an email to warlordworlds at gmail.com. You can easily find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the name Warlord Worlds. And you can listen to our show through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and Spotify. And all of our Mike Grell-themed episodes are available at warlordworlds.com. You can also find the show on YouTube as part of the Rad Adventures Network. That's Rad. R-A-D, which is short for Ruth and Darren. On the Rad Adventures YouTube channel and at RadAdventuresNetwork.com, you'll find all of the episodes of all of our podcasts, including Warlord Worlds, as well as Trekker Talk about 23rd Century Bounty Hunter Mercy St. Clair by Ron Randall, and Xenozoic Xenophiles about the Cadillacs and Dinosaurs series Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review. Every review helps the podcast be more likely to show up in search results. And on YouTube, we hope you'll subscribe to the channel and give us some likes on the videos. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you will come back next time for another new episode of Warlord Worlds. Warlord Worlds is a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. For more information, visit comicspodcast.com. We are not affiliated with DC Comics or Mike Grell. The views expressed on the show are solely ours. Music is taken from the album Royalty-Free Instrumental Music for Movies and Websites. We make no money from this podcast and no copyright infringement is intended. 